Hello, everyone. My name is Jess Krieger, and I'm a scientist. But I'm not just any kind of scientist. I grow meat in cell cultures instead of from animals. My story is just a small part of a much bigger one, one that connects all of us in this room and beyond these walls. It's the story of climate change and the future of our planet. It takes courage to face our future, but luckily we're facing it together. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of how I learned what my contribution to solving the problem of climate change is going to be. But first, a little context. The um, screen isn't working. Oh, here we go. But first, a little context. This is me in my natural habitat with a, a virtual reality system playing video games. See, when I grew up, I had older brothers, so video games have always been a huge part of my life. And playing video games was kind of like learning to think like a scientist. You have your problems that you have to solve, you have to do troubleshooting, and you have to persist against all odds. And learning to think like this really came in handy when I encountered a problem that I wanted to solve. In 2010, I saw for the first time what goes on inside of a slaughterhouse. It was something that shocked me to my core, and I immediately became obsessed with this problem. I started learning everything that I could about animal agriculture. And that's when I realized that animal agriculture is a major chapter in the story of climate change. We all know that greenhouse gases trap and emit heat, and that's how they warm the planet. But did you know that 14.5% of all global greenhouse gas emissions come from animal agriculture? That's more than transportation worldwide. Animal ag is such a potent contributor to climate change because of the types of greenhouse gases involved. Animal ag is responsible for 9% of carbon dioxide emissions, 37% of methane emissions, and 65% of nitric oxide emissions. Now, while most of the time we hear about carbon dioxide with respect to global warming, methane and nitric oxide are especially troubling gases because they have a higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide. Methane has 23 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide has 296 times the warming potential. The bigger our global herd, the more greenhouse gases are emitted, and the worse the consequences for the environment. This is an aerial photo of a cattle feedlot in Texas. You can see little dots that are the cattle to the left of the image and toxic runoff from the feedlots polluting the environment to the right of the image. This is obviously not a pretty picture. But unfortunately for the environment, our meat-heavy Western diet is trending, and it's predicted that during this century, demand for meat is going to double. Clearly, we have a huge problem that is going to get worse as time goes on. The obvious solution that policymakers and scientists around the world have suggested is that we stop eating so much meat. And I personally took this to heart. But in trying to get other people to cut down on their meat consumption, I wasn't so successful because who wants to stop eating bacon? Meat tastes great. I mean, you can't deny that. But at that time, I felt like I had failed my mission, and I felt like maybe we're doomed if we can't change. And it was a very depressing moment for me. 
I was stuck at a boss that I couldn't beat. How could I possibly compete with the taste of a cheeseburger when you're out with friends? Or a hot dog at a baseball game? Or a turkey dinner at Thanksgiving? But all of that changed one day in my introductory biology course. I learned about a new field uh, called tissue engineering. And tissue engineering is the growth of three-dimensional tissues outside of the body, but inside of a bioreactor. And as soon as I learned about this, I started geeking out. I thought it was the coolest thing that I'd ever heard of. And I started to learn as much as I could about it. And I started thinking to myself, if we can grow human tissues for medical reasons, can we grow animal tissues for food? So I decided to take a leap into the unknown and find out for myself. I was so energized by the idea that I could grow the foods that people know and love without hurting the environment. So to use gamer terminology, I started gaining experience points and I leveled up into becoming a scientist. And since then, I started growing meat in a lab. And as with all good ideas, I discovered that I wasn't the only person doing this. In 2013, the world's first in vitro, aka cultured beef burger, was tasted in London. It was created by Dr. Mark Post of the Netherlands, and it was the world's most expensive burger in history, costing $330,000. It's quite a hefty price tag for a burger. But this project was bankrolled by one of the founders of Google, and it showed the world that this is actually possible. Then in 2016, I became familiar with a research institute called New Harvest. New Harvest is a nonprofit research institute that funds in vitro meat research. And I met other scientists on the same quest as me. But the cool part about New Harvest is it's not just consisting of scientists on our team. It's funded entirely by private donors, people like you and me trying to make this happen. In a way, it's kind of like grassroots food science. With the support of New Harvest, I've started growing pork. This is an image of a pork cell culture that I recently grew here at Kent State. And this is the beginning of the research that is going to give us in vitro bacon, coming to a store near you. <laughs> but also, sometimes, you have to design technology around your solution. So I'm also working on bioreactor design. This is a bioreactor system that my colleagues and I created that we call an artificial heart. This artificial heart pumps artificial blood into meat so it can get the oxygen and the nutrients it needs to grow big and strong. Truly, in vitro meat is the smart future of food, one that over overcomes so many of the limitations of the archaic system of animal agriculture. But for such a promising solution, I worry about some of the challenges that this food might face, such as, will this be considered a GMO? Or will people distrust this food because it came from biotechnology? And how will this be regulated? But for all of these possible challenges, there are so many exciting opportunities. Here's the thing. Since we can now grow food with so much more control than has ever before been attainable, we can have things like meat with healthier fats, or red meat that doesn't cause colon cancer or fish without the mercury. No longer do you have to be afraid of your sushi. Or we could even have things like meat from endangered or extinct species, 
such as giraffe steaks or mammoth steaks, like our ancestors used to eat. Truly, there are so many mind-blowing possibilities that greatly expand our culinary horizons. Personally, I can't wait to eat bacon again. But science has brought us here. Science develops cheat codes for the universe. But deeper than that, science is a shining light into darkness. It is the sword of truth with which we defend ourselves from lies, falsehoods, and alternative facts. It gave us the internet, antibiotics. It put a human on the moon. And it can help us solve climate change. I'm on a mission to make that happen. Will you join me? Thank you. If you're interested in following my in vitro bacon progress, I have a Twitter account that I post all of my progress on. You can follow me at my handle there. Thank you.